Greetings, Gothamites, and welcome to my back cave and episode 81 of I Am The Night, which covers season three, episode two of Batman the Animated Series, Sins of the Father. But wait, where is the other half of the dynamic duo? Miraculously, we're doing this one in person, even though we set up the first two episodes to do it sort of remotely because of where we all live. Hello, we're actually here to get a look. Strange visitor from another part of London. Hello, it's good, <laughs> it's good to be back here in person talking about Sins of the Father, the second episode of season four. Three. Uh, season three, of course. <laughs> There's no, part four on the box, DVD box set. Um, yeah, and uh, it's very apropos. It's called Sins of the Father, and I'm here with my actual father, but he's not that sinful. Well, according to Mother, this entire room is sinful, but hey, let's not go there. Sinful, tasteful. <laughs> it's uh, fantastic. <laughs> And uh, what a great episode, written by Rich Fogel and directed by Kurt Gator again, two mainstays from the original uh, seasons. Um, I want to let you talk first because I've got so much to say about this episode and how brilliant it is for so many ways. So your thoughts first. I did love it as a great character piece to set up this new Robin Mm. and a great character piece to sort of like uh, tease the audience into what happened to Robin Pryor. Um, we had a lot of very satisfying character moments and like lots of personal growth with all of the main bat, uh, bat heroes as well, as well as the classic return of a villainous fa- fan oh, yes. favourite. Um, as fun as it was and as good as it was to see all of that uh, well-handled sort of exploration of these characters, I think some of the new takes on Batman lore and some of the... Um, some of the tone changes and some of the ways that this series so far has been structured has been like a bit of an interesting take. So yeah. it'll be uh, be interesting to sort of unpack that a little further because like we've got lovely classic stuff. But we've also got sort of uh, storytelling question marks uh, in my opinion. In my opinion, oh absolutely. I mean, it's genius writing. Um, I don't know if uh, Kurt and the rest of the writing team had a plan for this season or how they were going to do it, but. It's masterfully handled. Clearly, they couldn't tell Jason Todd's story. They couldn't have a Robin that was murdered by the Joker on, as we always say, a family show. But what they've done amazingly well is marry the modern um, post-crisis Jason Todd's origin with Tim Drake's. Mm. The fact that, on the whole, uh, people hated Jason Todd in the comics, specifically the second version. And when he was a carbon copy of Dick Grayson, they loved him. Mm. And I did, and I thought, well, this is back in the same story. He's still a circus kid. He's still thing, and he's basically got the same origin as Dick Grayson. The only difference is he's got red hair, which he dyes black to be Robin. What is the thing in that? But people love that iteration of Jason Todd. When the Crisis on Infinite Earths reset DC continuity, um, they introduced Jason as a street kid trying to steal the tires off the Batmobile. And for me, he was a much more fascinating character because he was different, but too different. Mm. Not many people agreed with me. So what they've done brilliantly with this Tim Drake is still a massive Batman fan. Yes. Still incredibly capable and self-taught. Yes. They've kept that. Uh, they've given him Jason Todd's uh, Streetwise. Exactly. So it's a perfect combination of both of both um, Robins. But the brilliant part as well is when Marv Wolfman and George Perez created Tim Drake, yeah. they'd already made... Dick Grayson dropped. They're the ones who got Dick out of the Bat Cave, turned him into Nightwing, made him leader of the Titans, and gave him his own path. So that's why they were the perfect choices to introduce the third Robin, Tim mm. Drake. And what they did brilliantly in the comics was is they immediately made a link with Dick Grayson by having him at the circus the night Dick's parents were killed. Right. And they have him having the same almost fatal encounter with the same villain because Dick's real nemesis in the comics was a Joker. It was always two. Right. Two-Face was Tim's first real nemesis in the comics when he was introduced. So they had that link together. And they've copied that here. Mm -hmm. They've done the same thing for the show. So it's absolutely brilliant. And by having, well, we'll come to that, an appearance of Mr. Grayson, still played by Lauren Lister, which makes my heart very happy. (laughs) Um, I love everything about this episode. I didn't know if I could take to this new version of Tim Drake because because of what they do in the Joker Returns Batman Beyond animated movie, which I really didn't like. But at that point, like here, Tim was still new in the comics as well, so they didn't know that he was going to become the fan favourite and arguably, to most people's minds, the best Robin. Yeah, it's interesting to think about this sort of um, 
sort of in retrospect because to us these characters are just like huge mainstays yeah, so exactly. like they've like kind of almost always been there yeah. so hearing about them as like a new character and they're still sort of testing the wars with them it's a very interesting take to sort of get that new perspective so yeah it's a pleasant surprise i'd say it makes total sense as to why they had to handle it the way they yeah, did absolutely uh there's no way you can tell that kind of story lightly there's times when even in the live action movies they've been never alluded to it, but never actually told that story on on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. This is the a great way of just like honouring both Robins, yes. but putting almost a new spin on it. I just think that there may have been a way to, you know, I think there may have been a way to sort of still tell it because there's been may have been enough of a time where, um, Bruce Batman was done with Robin because Nightwing left yeah. and then maybe something else calamitous happened that could have been a Jason Todd-esque character yeah. but that's not something they'll ever really explore on, a, on this kind of show because of the tone yeah. so the way they've handled it here is as, as good as they can do and yeah they did do it well really well and as you say with real talent and the guys who make this TV show and equally and I have to say this for listeners and viewers out there if you've never read any of the Batman Adventures series of comics read them um particularly if you want to know more about why they didn't have a jason todd in the first season of batman the adventures continue which you can pick up in graphic novel form right now they tell jason todd's story and in such a way that it doesn't take away from the impact of his passing at the joker's hands um it makes him again a little bit more likable a little more understandable and it marries in brilliantly with dick grayson and Tim Drake. So, um, yeah, what I would recommend as well is pick up a graphic novel, which I've just given to this one called Nightwing Rising, which yeah. collects Batman the Adventure, the Batman Adventures, the Lost Years, which shows why Dick left and what he did and how he became Nightwing. And I think that'll tie in with future episodes because the line he um, utters, well, yes, Dick Grayson returns at the very end of this episode. Uh, the line he utters is from this same graphic novel, or maybe they put it in the graphic novel time with the series it's just brilliantly brilliantly done yeah it's a it's something i know is a thing called intertextuality where one piece of media refers to another just to sort of sort of show that it's connected in a way without it just openly saying like this is connected to this because you don't necessarily have to have read those comics to be able to follow the tv show but uh you get rewarded for knowing it absolutely so yeah having that connection in is just definitely worthwhile and yeah, we get that. We get that sense that the story carries on and is related to the comics as opposed to the TV show. And I mean, obviously, it'll probably be different, but I imagine um, there won't be too much of a difference as to why Dick Grayson left in the, in this version of the Batman universe because compared to the uh, uh, classic comics. Yeah, well, in the Batman Adventures comics, they always make sure they don't mess with the continuity of the TV show. They tie in and fit in perfectly. Wow. So I've got a feeling that they'll just say they did travel the world, learned these new martial arts and became Nightwing. And in the comics, is we find out how and why, mm. um, which is brilliant. But because you know me, I'm a massive nerd and I'm a stickler for continuity. And usually having Tim appear, as he did in Holiday Nights in the first episode, as yeah. Robin... I actually think it was brilliant because you watch want, it. Yeah, I don't want to talk to you about that. You watch it and you think, hang on, whoa, this isn't Dick Grayson. Who is this kid? And in the second episode, they answer that question. So I actually find that very satisfying. I think we can... I think the way they chose to structure the series is why it's important is why I'm willing to forgive it. I think I'm going to take it as they wanted to hit the series with the ground from the ground running. So they wanted Absolutely. to show all facets of how big the Batman family is for keeping Gotham safe. Yeah. And they wanted to show all the different ways they maintain justice. So there's, um, we see them all in action yeah. and including this new Robin there in the fringes, but that's also specifically just a Christmas, New Year's, the end of the year. Stuff. Exactly. This, this story where this new Robin's introduced, that could have been at any time. So we're allowed to jump in time just a little bit because we don't necessarily need to be married to the whole thing and just like, oh, this Robin's here now, but where did he come from? Oh, this is where it came from. And cool, we could just put that backwards in our mind. But they wanted to tell that strong Christmas montage vignette story because 
is a very strong way to hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah. They literally wanted to capture the audience straight away with an all action piece with as many of the great Batman classic characters as possible. And now they can tell us who these characters are when they're new characters. And I found that fascinating. Um, very brave thing mm. about this episode was, and some people would say it's cold, but Tim knew the way they broached the fact that Tim's dad is most likely dead was really quickly, but I think not gently, but subtly. Yeah. Subtly handled. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I didn't get that read at all. No, uh, it wasn't made overt to me. Yeah. I sort of took it at face value that like Tim's dad was a shady dude. Yeah. And was probably like, Got into some trouble somewhere. The fact that like he was presumed dead, I didn't register. So if that can happen, if we can get that different read between two different kinds of viewers, yeah. that probably means that it's good enough to be able to like for some who read into that, they see it. It's not necessarily a huge deal that is just that justifies the story. Yeah. Do you think as well though that by Batman standing up because obviously Batgirl says, "Oh, we don't know for sure." Yeah. Batman says, "No, know. we know." He's already treating this new Robin differently with a bit more respect and not patronizing him, not saying, oh, kid, you know, there's a chance. He's just saying, take it like this because this is most likely the scenario. Yeah, I, I, I think this Batman is very compassionate. It's not, a, it's not a quality you usually associate with Batman, mm -hmm. but that's something, a, a quality that Batman should be associated with. So that level of care and attention for this kid who might be literally on the streets alone. Yeah. If he doesn't, if he doesn't step in, then what's the alternative? Yeah, exactly. And it's like with everything in many ways, um, while people say, how can Batman subject the child or a teenager to this lifestyle? I still honestly believe that if he hadn't, um, with all three of the circumstances, Jason Todd in particular, what could have happened to them would have been way, way worse. Yeah, let's 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 do that thought experiment. Actually, yeah. um, I think Dick Grayson would have become like very sinister, trying to get revenge for the death of Lion Graysons. I fully believe that uh, um, Jason Todd would have become Red Hood regardless. Yeah, he would have just been less but a criminal. Red yeah, Hood. a criminal Red Hood, but without the level of unhingedness, he would have just been cold and calculating. He was he wasn't pushed over the edge by his uh the, the worst post traumatic stress anyone could ever go through dying. Tim Draco, I think he would have he would have stayed fairly level headed. He would have either become some sort of lawman or some yeah. sort of detective. Agreed. But like not necessarily with the skill set that he would have gained working with Batman. Yeah. But that's because again, Tim out of all the Robins was the one who chose him. He wasn't thrust upon him, he didn't have a tragic well. His tragic story about his parents comes later when he's already a fully French Robin in the comics. So it was different. But as you say, I still think because of his capability, because of his tech savvy, because of his intelligence, he still would have joined. He would have been, um, oh, what's the character's, the actor's name? The guy who plays, um, the detective in the last Southern Island Batman film. Oh, Blake. Um, yeah. Just Gordon Levitt. Yeah. He would have been that yeah. character, I think. Yeah. He would have gone on to become a future Nightwing or Batman off his own back. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of um, fan theories that joke about uh, that, that that version of the character going into the role and then not doing especially well because he has like a tenth of the training that Batman has. Mm -hmm. But that's a very pessimistic view. I think that Blake in the movie would have done an okay job and Tim Drake in, the, in this TV show and in the comics would have done very well. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's not forget that John Blake is a detective and a police officer. Yeah. And as far as I could tell, there's some military training there as well. Maybe. So with Batman's resources and knowledge of the law, I think he would have done admirably. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. Now, I want to touch on several little beautiful character moments in this episode. This, this, this episode, honestly, it's blown my mind. I loved it. Oh. For a start, Binary compound um, with the gas. Yeah. Very two faced. And I do believe this predates Die Hard 3. I was going to ask, I was going to wonder if that was a Die Hard 3 reference or if it would predate Die I Hard 3. I think this predates, I might be wrong. So, listeners, viewers, let us do, know if do I am. Us, yeah. Um, but Two Face has been using binary compound in the comics. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, like an, an epoxy like that is like a very common thing in chemistry. Yeah. Like two things that are 
very different on their own, but when you mix them, they do something else. It's a very two-faced thing to do. Yeah. Um, I want to mention <laughs> Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., your Alfred in this episode. Just the way he delivers lines. Oh, my. And, oh, yes, he used to drive Master Dick wild. Mm. Like, he's baiting him to put on the costume because maybe we have seen Batman go off the rails slightly without a Robin. Maybe Batgirl helped save him, but having Tim in his life again is that catalyst for him knowing what he's fighting for. Yeah. Um, so amazing work from it from as, as Alfred. Oh yeah, most definitely. We can count on his performance to be like one of the consistently strongest up there with um your Mark Hamels and your Kevin Conroy's. I would say he did that in a way to sort of encourage, but also like reassure the audience because yes. the audience sort of comes in and sees this like streetwise kid who knows a bit too much. And like, for those who might not be aware of the comics as much, would be a little bit dubious to this kid. Yeah. Just like, what's this deal? You can't get the read on what he's like, but Alfred has his trust immediately. Like Alfred trusts this kid and Alfred confides in this kid enough, even though, all we see is him to sort of snoop around, but never actually say, oh, Bruce Wayne, I was right, like Tim Drake did. Yeah. He just sees him and be like, oh, the Waynes, interesting. So Alfred's the one who puts the trust in him first, not yeah. Batman. Uh, but that is en enough trust that he needs to be able to be like, all right, kid, you're in the family. Let's uh, We'll do a training montage with these giant cotton buds right at the end of the episode. Yeah, absolutely. At this stage, of course, we've got to remember that Alfred raised both Bruce and Dick. Yeah. So he knows that, well, a, this kid already knows. He's found out. We can't shut him up. We're not the villains here. Let's bring him in. And by doing that, by giving this kid the benefit of the doubt and giving him that trust, again, he's making sure that Tim's on the right path from day one, a path which, sadly, his own real father didn't leave him on. And that, to me, again, yeah. is masterful storytelling. Yeah, because that is... Very grassroots, real world, like surrogate family level heroics. We see this in like the foster system yeah. in the real world all the time because certain, certain kids can get themselves down very dark paths if they get neglected or forgotten by the system. So it's a very extreme and like fantastical case of it, but still, yeah. um, a kid that could otherwise turn out pretty rough oh, is uh, redeemed and goes towards living a, a virtuous life. And obviously, as as you know, as well as I do, that the theme of found family in comics, particularly with the Batman family, mm. is so strong and so powerful because Bruce's whole journey is losing his real family and then spending the rest of his life trying to make his own, yeah. even though he's the loner. He's the one that can't work well with others. No one's got a bigger family mm. than Batman. No, but that's another thing. This is another thing that's sort of like, is why Batman's so big in the zeitgeist? Yeah. Most of the other like main cast of the superhero teams, main cast of the Justice League, they all have big teams and big backings as well around them. Can anybody name them as much as you can rattle off the names of some of the exactly. Robins and some of the Batgirls? Exactly. Really? I mean, yeah. It's like you just think of Superman as like Lois Lane, sometimes Jimmy Olsen, yeah, sometimes Perry White, yeah, uh, and then like Supergirl, yeah, and then mm, absolutely uh, Wonder Woman. You just think of Hippolyta, and then maybe Wonder Girl, and then. Uh, yeah, I I I still blow people's mind when people ask me, "Well, oh, why do you like Green Lantern so much?" Well, it's like, which one? There's so many. How many? There's like been six or seven human Green Lanterns, but nobody knows. Yeah, it just sort of proves the point. Whereas if you go to Batman fans, you'll just rattle off names. Same with same with villains. You'll rattle off Batman villains for ages. But yeah, look at a Flash, Gorilla Grodd, Mirror Master, Reverse Flash. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely, Lex Luthor. Uh, there's something about how well defined the cast of characters is around Batman that's just captured imaginations for so long, yeah. which is why we can have very nice, clever little twists and remixes on certain characters exactly. like Tim Drake here to have certain elements that resemble Jason Todd, but it still somehow feels very new, but still very sincere. And we can get that sort of take of a character being welcome and growing up to be the hero that we know in the comics. Yeah. And do you not find as well, because of that, that this is a great, as this series always has been, entry point into Batman North for people who don't read the comics. It's the only, it's a really strong entry point because it handles the 
structure the same way that the comics do. It is single, is incidental, isolated little adventures of Batman doing heroics yeah. up against the supervillains, but there's the ongoing narrative threaded through it of the family dynamics, his own trauma, his connection to the other characters, and watching them all grow. That's how it's told in the comics. That's how it's told in long and short form media. So they're able to like make it here and then mirror the tone and then also mirror the very different tones that Batman's had over the 80 plus years of existence. And still make it timeless. Yes. It's brilliant. Another wonderful touch. And this is Wayne Manor now becoming a character mm. in, in and of itself. The fact that Alfred clearly puts Tim in Dick's bedroom mm. because when Tim wakes up almost in a horror movie-esque scenario where he sits but upright in bed and the leaves and the trees are shaking outside the window but then he focuses on what's stenciled on the window instead of a Robin Hood Dick Grayson's childhood hero it's Robin oh yeah magic that really really oh I can't put into it how happy that made me it's uh it's again because look at a bit of the episode as well. For the first sort of like 30% of the episode, Adam was quite injured. Yeah. So a lot of it was him sort of recovering whilst um, he was doing a lot of detective work on the back computer and, and relaying with Batgirl. So Alfred was the one who was sort of leading the family dynamic and trying to like make this kid feel safe, feel welcome, whilst tipping the hand to say, this is who we are, this is who was here, you could be this person. Yeah. And that kind of level of care and attention is something that I think would have been really needed. I think Batman, if he were like at full strength, he would have been very wary and only at the end would he have uh, let Tim in. And then it would have taken a long time to put yeah. that level of trust in. If, because Alfred was there so accommodating in the beginning and showing him those uh, little moments to make him feel so welcome, that's what led to him actually like yeah. being in from the drop and being brave enough to be able to go and pull Batman's fat out of the fire right at the end. I think another thing is if that hadn't happened, because we saw Batman's tone right at the end, yeah. like, you, you're training with me, you're welcome, but I set the tone. If, if Tim didn't feel that welcome from Alfred at the beginning, yes. would he have been that receptive? Exactly. Yeah, so he needed that actual ally figure to be someone who he, he didn't expect to ever be in the situation because like, he knows so much about Batman. He doesn't know how Batman operates. So seeing this old English dude, it's like a surprise, but this old English dude was very caref- caring, very welcoming, very homely. Oh, yes. And that was the anchor point he needed so that he can just feel safe and calm yeah. in this new living environment whilst getting all the Batman training. Yeah, there you go. And again, some masterful storytelling in the fact that sometimes it's hard to make Batman vulnerable and have him injured or get hurt in a way that the audience will believe and grasp and understand. Yeah. And it's really well done in this episode because having a 12-year-old kid helping save Batman is always something that people will think, uh, that's not going to happen. But the way it's handled where Batman's injured because he's protecting the kid, where Tim helps Batman and immediately you see from before he even meets Batman, from the posters on his wall, that this is a guy who wants to follow in Batman's footsteps rather than his father's. Mm. And it's such subtle little things like that that makes this episode so damn strong. And then you get all the brilliant comic book elements as well where Tim saves Batman after Batman saves him. Tim's reaction to the new Awesome bat boat bat sub. My God, that's the yeah, that is cool. good. Um, this episode just it's got soap, it's got drama, it's got family, and it's got all the comic book action thrown in as well. Honestly, this to me, and I thought season three wouldn't match up the first two, could be one of my favorite and strongest episodes of all thus so far today. Yeah. Loved it. I think we went into the season very dubious because you knew nothing never about it. it. Yeah. Never, never seen it. I'm still a little sad to see the loss of the title cards, the old, yeah. like the old, uh, I missed that too. 19, 1940s cinema style, but I'm willing to forgive it because that means that we've got like a few extra seconds of uh, story time yeah. on screen and we've not lost any of the quality of the stories. Oh, yeah. Even a little bit. We are still rewarded with well-driven character moments and well-handled portrayals of 
Batman and the Batman family that we've been seeing for decades at this point. Everything's still very consistent, and I'm still happy to see it. Yeah, and we've got all the great actors still here, and the one change we have had, again, we we, we sang Tara Strong's praises, oh, no ending loss, so I'm not going to do it again, um, because that became the Tara, Tara Strong love fest, as she deserves. Yeah, Matthew Valencia, the vulnerability and the strength um, the crying moments when he realises his dad isn't coming back. A lot of child actors could have really messed that up and over-egged it. His was a subtle, nuanced performance, something well above a child of those years. And like I said, every single cast member, Andrea Romano, voice coach, voice director, I salute you. Your casting skills are beyond reproach. That's true. Um, but... This has all the strengths of the Batman animated series of before, plus some new curveballs and new characters brilliantly handled, thrown in for good measure. Yeah, most definitely. We uh, we didn't lose anything here. It's been a it's been a return to form. There was never there was never any break in the quality of the storytelling. Mm. I I had faith in it going yeah. into it, and I'm glad to see that it's uh, we've got faith reward and. Another set of strong stories. And let's let it, let it continue. So on that note, um, your main takeaways or things you want to bring up about Sins of the Father? Well, we've emphasised that it's still a um, uh, a crossover, a crossing character between Jason and Tim, which is why yeah. it was it was a very weird sight right at the end. Um, Tim is attacked by a dude with a crowbar, yeah. which is just like, <laughs> oh... Oh, they yes. re- they know who they're trying to reference yeah. here without referencing yes. this. So, I, and that's as close as we'll ever get to see yeah. that. But it's still a nice level of care and attention to know that it's, it's that the comics it's there for the comics fans to recognise that yes, this is the character we are trying to tell without actually telling the gruesome bloody murder. And yeah, this is how we've handled it. Take it or leave it. There's a very bold choice on their part. Absolutely, well said. For me, I've got to say it again, I'm really, really happy about the detective elements mm. they're throwing in. And it's particularly brilliant because they're throwing it in with both Bruce and Tim yeah. in this episode. Bruce, because he takes one look at the impression of that key on that letter that Tim held from his dad and knew exactly where that key went. Yeah. And then Tim, where he says, I think I know where two faces. Mm. The Janice movie theater. And that little touch, obviously, you probably know your mythology better yeah. than most people out there. James is a Roman god with two faces. There you go. Brilliant. Yeah. Because uh, then again, you kept saying a lot to do it while we were recording this just now about um, Tim Drake having lots of posters of Batman. That's only part true. Well, I remember the first appearance of Tim Drake in the comics you gave me to read many, many mm. moons ago. But a lot of the posters that he had there, as well as in the comics, weren't just posters. They were newspaper clippings. Yes. So he was trying to analyze yeah. Batman's style and fighting, Batman's detective work, Batman's gadgetry, something, just to try and understand him because he was still the detective then and he's still the detective here. Absolutely. And again, we've got to think about the, the time constraints because obviously when uh, Tim Drake was introduced in the comics, we had months to read about him and learn about him. Mm-hmm. He didn't just become Robin overnight. It was a period of a few issues. So the way they do it in this is the fact that he doesn't work out that Bruce Wayne is Batman because he's worked out that Tim Drake, to Dick Grayson was Robin. Hmm. He's helped save Batman. He's taken to the house. He finds out Bruce is Batman that way. So they have literally told the same story, hmm. but in a much more concise and easy to consume way, which is, is a brilliant uh, piece of storytelling. He's um, trained himself on the streets to yeah. be an acrobat rather than learn from Dick Grayson and copies Dick Grayson's moves growing up. So they've given us the same Tim Drake, but as you said, the street savviness makes up for the detective part of it, but there is a whole lot of detective going on in this episode. There's nothing more I can say. I just thought this episode was a masterpiece. It really was. I went into it um, recognizing that they had to make certain concessions yes. for the for the sake of the characters, but discussing it a little bit more, I can see that those concessions have merit. Uh, they're still very sincere to the original characters, and it overall added up to a very strong story that introduced this version of Robin well, whilst teasing us viewers a look into what Nightwing's going to be like. Oh. Which is that's be, the bit I can't wait for. That's going to be very exciting. And you will hear our takes about that next time here on the I Am The Night podcast. Oh, yes, they will. But until they do, Adam, my 
no longer sidekick every bit as able hero as I am. Tell the universe where they can hear your voice and read your work and see more about what you do on Tintinet. I have uh, branched out to my own corner of the internet, much like my much like our dear friend Nightwing going off to Bloodhaven. For <laughs> Batman-flavoured things, look no further than Dark Knight News. I review multiple titles a month. Both Catwoman and Batman, Do- Do- uh, Batman and the Joker Deadly Duo are in excellent spots right now. Excellent titles. But for my one true love, PC and tabletop gaming, look to our pride and joy, fantasticuniverses.com, where in written form I'll talk about Collectible card games, gacha games, uh, PC open betas, and whatever else takes my fancy, as well as the odd tabletop review here and there, right there on that website. And you'll hear my dulcet tones on the Fantastic Universes podcast, Fantastic Plays, where a special guest and I talk about whatever PC console, tabletop, or gaming experience we wish to talk about of the evening. Follow me on Twitter at is it Synchro, and this is my solemn vow. I'm going to stop procrastinating. My own internet at home is just about good enough, so you will find me on twitch.tv forward slash is it Synchro, streaming playable card games such as Magic the Gathering, Legends of Runeterra, Marvel Snap, and some that no one's ever heard of, but I have because I like card games. And where can the universe find your good works? Once you've watched and listened to all that stuff, do so. Read it. Watch it. Love it. It's good. Um, you can catch me on uh, Twitter at lstevo, E-L underscore S-T-E-E-V-O. You can catch this show and the main DC Comics News podcast on the DC Comics News Podcast Network on Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Wherever you find your podcasts, we will be there, lurking in the shadows just like Batman and assaulting your eardrums. Um, DC Comics News and Dark Knight News and Fantastic Universes. Just search Steve, J, Ray, or Fantastic Universes to take you to my news reviews, features and interviews across those three wonderful websites on the social medias at DC Comics News for Twitter at dknews.com for Dark Knight News and at Fan Universes or Fantastic Universes. But until you go on these quests and take these adventures, there's something you need to do and remember. I am the night. We are the night. This has been the I Am The Night podcast. Thank you for listening. And until next time, read more comics and watch more Batman. Batman.